The broadcast is live. So uh, for, for those tuning in, we have Dr. Craig right with us. Say, hey, Dr. Craig. Now, where are you based, Craig? Uh, primarily just outside of London. So, I mean, um, uh, the office is actually in Oxford Circus and, and surrounding areas. But um, we've also got some uh, locations in other parts of the world, in um, uh, Eastern Europe, um, as well as other bits and pieces here, there, and everywhere. Switzerland. Um, yeah. I hate to even think. Yeah, it, it's kind of all over. So... You and I, obviously, we met at the CoinGeek conference, um, mm -hmm. but, bef but before that, in your own career, how did you get involved in the world of blockchain? Um, well, Take me I mean, all I way started back, Greg. But, well, I started it all, but um, how did I get involved in all this? I mean, that's a hard question. What things are and aren't sort of formative? Uh, setting up the Nipper network as part of the move for the... Australian Stock Exchange to go online and, and um, dematerialize shares would have been part of it. That was uh, back in the early to mid 90s. Uh, that sort of creating um, a system that uh, joined all the uh, individual exchanges around the country, um, joined all the brokers, allowed sort of quick trading, etc. Um, that started some of it. I mean, it was um, uh, a mutual. People don't realize that um, before they exist as they do on, on themselves now, they're, they're a traded uh, exchange on their own exchange. Uh, but before that, they were uh, what was basically a partnership between a whole lot of stockbrokers, so a mutualized group. So each of the stockbrokers owned part of the Australian Stock Exchange. So, I mean, that is really what you would see is a true form of decentralized, not this, we don't have rules, we don't have government. Everything has rules. It's whether you admit to them or not. Every system does. Even criminal groups have rules. So what we have is a group of brokers who form together, set up a, uh, a network. They implemented um, sort of controls uh, that allowed them to actually trade a lot wider, to bring in things like E-Trade and whatever else to be able to um, do share trading um, um, in a more distributed manner. And um, building uh, or helping to build and secure that network uh, would have been the first part of it, really. You know, but from your standpoint, when you now look at to see where we've gone, since the early days ha have we gone far enough do we still have a distance to go are we still early like where do you see it through your lens um i still see it back in 1994 in the internet um back then we had uh, hundreds of types of network protocol and people were running around like uh, microsoft network and compuserve um decknet novell all these people saying we can be the network. And that's what we have now with this concept of blockchain. And people will sort of think that um, Tim May's idea of everyone having their own currency. I mean, I liked Tim May, he's dead now, but um, when it came to economics, um, I've seen gophers with better ideas of how economics works. Um, I mean, he was a great computer scientist, but um, he was very much a dilettante when it came to other areas. and. Uh, and that's part of the problem. Just been uh, writing something on um, uh, sort of Judge Easterbrook back in 1996 wrote about the law of horses. So this was in um, response to he was uh, approached and invited to do a sort of uh, a paper and a piece and a talk at the University of Chicago. And mm -hmm. he approached them with the the idea, I mean, it was to do with property rights in cyberspace. And, and the thing was, why would you want property rights in cyberspace as an area to study? That's an interesting what? thing to study. But it's not the way you're thinking. It's His argument was it's like the law of horses. If you want to understand law, you don't focus it on an individual area. You don't study every case where some person's been kicked in the head by a horse. If you want to understand torts, 
um, like wrongful damage and, and that sort of thing and, and damages, then you get a good concept by understanding a lot of different areas. So if you want to understand contract, you don't look at contract as cybercrime. You don't look at contract in cyberspace or blockchains. You look at it as a whole. So if we're considering this, what is it like? Well, does the law need something new? And Lord Denning, for instance, back in the introduction of telex uh, 70 years ago, a new technology, basically said, well, if we're going to have communication by telex, then we can analogize that by thinking about two people on either side of a stream. Imagine that they want to negotiate a ferry and one of them calls out to the other and then someone returns the offer. What happens if they haven't been heard? What happens if there's a sound? Someone makes like someone shooting and uh, a shotgun goes off and they don't hear properly. Is there a contract? So if we can analogize the receipt of a transaction by a telex in the same way as people calling across a river, why can't we analogize even further? Why is it so different? He was referring not to any particular technology, but looking at two different distinct types. One, things that follow the postal rule, which is they're not instantaneous. I, I send a transaction and you will get it later versus something that is instantaneous. I give you a transaction and no matter where you are in the world, you can react that instant. So hmm. why is that so different? Why do we need a special law? If that same law applies to a telex, a fax machine, to email, to PayPal, why do we suddenly run around going, it's cryptocurrency, it's different, is it? We have either a postal transaction where it is put into the blockchain and later we get it, or we have an immediate response where we have some way of getting our wallet to instantly transact and know. But Craig, so could you just explain to those listening in, because you are so much higher than I am on the intellect scale, that what is the difference between blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Okay, so cryptocurrencies... Dumb it not down for me. All right, cryptocurrency is not a new idea. Um, it goes right back to, oh, back in the 80s with DigiCash, eCash, and other type things. Uh, the concept of cryptocurrency is some sort of system that is hidden, anonymous. Um, so Bitcoin's not really a cryptocurrency in the truest sense. It is digital cash and electronic transaction forms and all these but it's other very things. much trackable correct i mean tim draper sorry, is Tim's also a friend of mine tim said it is if you're a criminal the worst thing you can use is bitcoin because you I've can track said it. that many times i know and this is why we have seen um silk road people being arrested even um, sort of recently there have been more people why um just earlier in the year we saw another dark website and um uh, pedophilia like uh, exchange site taken down because people can follow the transactions. I mean, that's where people go wrong. They think it's like cash, it's anonymous. But cash is only anonymous up to a point. So if you think about it now, if you buy a house with cash, then alarm bells are going to go off and the bank's going to notify the authorities going that even if it's totally honest, that, hey, we've just got 120,000 US dollars worth of cash in a, in a bag maybe we should have a look at this and people will investigate. But on the other hand, if you buy a coffee at Starbucks, then nobody cares. I mean, if you hand over a 10 pound note here in Britain, then no one will look sideways and, and think, wow, cash. Well, right at the moment, they probably will because yeah. coronavirus, no one- like, yeah, They might the question say, look, Craig, I, I like <laughs> you, but I'm not willing to take that risk. Yeah, I'll just spray your cash down first, like when you've got one of those plastic notes. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So what does Craig Wright think about this pandemic? We'll get there, but let's go back to, to digital cash. So it's a form of electronic cash. Now, the big problem right back from um, in the original versions of digital cash has always been double spending. It is the typical problem. Electronic goods can be copied. 
No one solved that. That's the little problem that no one managed to solve. If I have a movie file, I can make a million copies of it. And which one's the original? Can you track it back? Is there a way to track it back to what was the original, Craig? That's the difficulty. Traditionally, no. But I solved it in a different way by not looking at which particular copy of electrons are the original, but designating a copy as being the original, the real tokens. So to do that, you register them. And whichever ones are registered are real. So imagine instead of a virtual item, you have a gray malleable metal that has a magical property that it can follow down ethernet wires and over Wi-Fi and instantly be transferred to another computer somewhere else. That's effectively what Bitcoin is. It is still a single token, but it exists as a single digital good because of the registration. And the registration is the blockchain. So it is like a journal, an entry that many people have. And the security isn't because of hashing and all these other things that people falsely say. It is because it is widely disseminated. The hash, the index, the part that takes all of that data and puts it into a single provable sort of index a marker, a record, that is given to everyone on the system, not just nodes or miners, but every user can get that. So going back to now on the blockchain aspect, so the world of blockchain we know is succeeding and it's doing well. Does it mean cryptocurrencies will, will I don't know, will last or that or that they will be around? Like are, are the two, do the two go together or the two completely separate things? There needs to be one. This is where people go wrong. There's only one internet. There's not hundreds of different networks. There were in the 90s, but all of that has died off. And the same will happen with this blockchain concept. Now, the security feature, how it works is that it is valuable. It has a digital property token that is saleable, transferable, etc. So the nature of Bitcoin is a digital token that has value that then can be paid to the nodes in order to incentivize them to keep protecting and, and scaling the network. So without digital currency, you don't get a blockchain. There's no such thing as a blockchain without digital currency, uh, contrary to what some people, uh, banks and whatever else want to try and make. The two are not separable. But in time, you won't have a reason to have many. For instance, why do you have Euro now? Because, well, it's easier and trade becomes smoother rather than going and having to exchange your Lira over to your Maltese, whatever the hells, over to your Deutsche Mark, over to your Frank, over as you travel around. And being Europe, if you get in the car, you go through like 20 countries in a day from end to end. And as yeah. you stop at each of those 20 petrol stations, uh, you have to pay different money. Well, now we have one and it just makes trade simple. So the same will happen. And Bitcoin, the thing isn't crypto gold or anything like this. It is purely the one thing that people have been seeking for a long time, which is micropayments. But so isn't, it, I have to cut in, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? Um, people make Ponzi schemes out of some of it, but no, the whole purpose of Bitcoin is effectively micropayments to have fractions of a cent to be able to transact for a single web page. Imagine paying a thousandth of a cent. Nobody really cares anymore about the sort of cost of transacting when it's that low. When you can buy a Google search or you can buy your day's worth of Google searches um, for a click of a button. And you don't need to worry about going into uh, all the security features that banks have or anything like this because, well, you're effectively chucking a few pennies at it. I mean, do you ensure that your um, sort of penny stash at work is protected? I mean, I've uh, had in the office before 
uh, change and left it in, in a coffee mug and no one steals it. So if you've only got 20 cents worth of change, do you really care? And yeah, it might, might be um, that as you get to larger amounts, it becomes something you protect. But the whole concept there again is being able to do micropayments. That would have radically changed how the internet is right now, rather than selling our information, rather than getting rid of and effectively exposing all of our private lives. Google, Facebook, all of these others would have been able to sell access, which was all they really wanted in the beginning. When Google used to have their motto of do no evil, it was, we'll find a way of doing micropayments, selling services to people, in which case it's cheap. But they couldn't solve that. So they moved on to ads. And Facebook, the same thing. And this is what Libra is about. They've been trying, this is Libra version five. So Facebook coin version five. They've been trying for 12 years and not being able to understand it and get it right. And they're still working on it. So they've got this horrible ad-based model now where they basically track you and find out everything about you and become, become big brother. Why? Because that's how they make money. Every time you click, advertisers get a share. So yeah. that would have been solved with, with Bitcoin. But unfortunately, uh, I didn't get Bitcoin developed soon enough to, um, to have it in there. You know, I have to say, you know, somebody that has gotten to know on a personal level, many people in the space that that the community. So those that are now tuning in that you can see that Craig is very likable. He is not the the monster, the demon that you've read about and that you do have this side that that does good. And and so that must be very challenging. And some of it, I, I will say that many influencers will bring on themselves. We've talked about a medical condition that that you live with. But what is that like to be attacked continuously? I mean, that doesn't feel good. I know when people take shots at me, it doesn't feel good. I mean, what's that been like for you and your family, Craig? Uh, family's the hardest bit. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, um, contrary to what people um, sort of like to think, all I'm doing is out there building. And um, yes, unfortunately for them, that means they have competition. And rather than competing, they attack. So they'll sit there going, but he's got patents. And I saw a thing from Eric Voorhees going, how I uh, can't be the creator of Bitcoin, I've got patents. Well, um, and? So what, because it's open source? Microsoft code is open source. Open source does not mean free or techno-communist. And Eric has patents. And his... Uh, want to be, because he's dead and can't argue, uh, Hal Finney. Hal Finney has uh, had patents, not defensive patents, patents that were sold for money. So all these people sit there acting hypocritically, going, you can't do X, Y, or Z. Why not? I mean, what? I'm supposed to sit back and let banks... Um, effectively patent everything I want to do or put it out there and allow people to twist it? I mean, what? Because I create a product and you don't want the same thing as me, that means I'm bad? Well, you know, go and compete. And that's why it seems to be there are so many players in this space that there hmm. are lots of very, very smart people. I mean, to somebody like you, now I'm going to put the words in your mouth, that I am nowhere even near your intellect. But what is that like to deal with others that you see them not being on your intellect, but they see you and saying, well, you're not on mine. That must make it very challenging um, in an industry where everybody seems to be really, really smart, or at least to themselves, they appear to be smart. Um, doesn't bother me. I mean, at the end of the day, they're not doing anything. I mean, this whole, um, we promise we'll get lightning and lightning will be there in 18 months and then 18 months and then 18 months and then 18 months and we're on our fifth 18 months and, now. And I, if I have to ask you again I need you to dumb it down for me what do you mean by lightning what does that mean uh, this is BTC's savior the lightning network where they think that uh, by putting a mesh on top of Bitcoin that you're going to save everything because um, they have this false idea that code is law 
which goes back to Lawrence Lessig and others in, um, like 30 years ago. Code isn't law. Code will never be law. The, the fallacy that no one seems to easily pick up and comprehend should be really simple. Code is a language. Code is written by humans. Computers don't code. Humans code. Everything that is created, every bit of intellect, every intent that exists is from humans. So when someone tells you that code is law, what they're really saying is, I've created a contract. It doesn't matter whether the terms are illegal in law. It doesn't matter whether it's badly drafted, the Dow. It matters only that because I say it should be right, stuff the world. My view of society trumps yours, which is really the attitude of someone who's a toddler. If you think about it, most of us grow out of this idea that I'm the only self, that I'm the only one who matters. I'm, I'm autistic and I've grown out of that. I've got Asperger's and I've moved on from this sense of self where I don't understand other people that way. So I mean, when you think about that, if you're not even catching up intellectually with someone who has Asperger's and you're stuck with this coder's law area where you can't understand that people program those computers. So putting that, uh, that language out there doesn't suddenly make it right. Now, seeing BSV as being now, so Bitcoin, Satoshi Vision, as being on the top market cap, I mean, that, that for you, it, do you feel that that is an achievement or do you say we should be number one? I don't care. I care about use. I mean, that, that's only an arbitrary how much you're pumping price and whatever. Come talk to me when most people on earth use it. I don't care if it stays at $1,000 in 20 years' time, but practically every person on earth is using it. And do you see that with your new vision? Do you see that everybody will use it? I mean, there's certain variables no, that are going to be not very my hard. New vision. To I'm going to interrupt there. That's not my new vision. All right. Bitcoin is electronic cash. It was always electronic cash. It's not digital gold. We have digital gold. Gold certificates exist. E-gold existed. Digital gold of all forms have existed. So Bitcoin is digital cash. To be cash isn't all these sort of arbitrary things going, cash is a cash book. No, it's actually a different origin of the word. The etymology of cash, as in cachet, is not cash as in money. They are two separate words from two separate languages. Cash means a tokenized form of exchange money, something that is linked to commoditized value, something that can be exchanged as an arbitrary underlying value of something that is small, fast, and generally final. So that's what Bitcoin's really about. So, so it's to be cash. It's to act as cash. Where it is to be BSV, cash. Again, I need you to dumb it down because I'm not on your your uh, your intellect. Difference between so now cash and BSV. What are the differences? Cash has a limit. Every limits exist all through this world. Whether we go down to the Planck length or up into sort of the universe, Bitcoin takes that limit. This one penny, five, uh, five cent piece, uh, dime, etc., and shrinks it down. And it makes it faster. It makes it something that we can now use over the internet, something that scales. It becomes something of beauty, not because I can have big transactions and allow drug dealers to get money in and out of Russia really quickly. No, because people who earn under $5 a day can now start getting paid and keep their money securely. People who want to set up small micro businesses can get paid without banks, not because Bitcoin replaces banks, because Bitcoin replaces 
cash. That's what it's really about. So imagine now I get a lot of people coming to my website and reading my article. I can charge them small amounts, fractions of a cent. So the journals in science and whatever else, they are expensive because there is a Kosian sort of transaction problem. It is too easy to copy them. So you can't get the true value and you can't charge the, the true value when you go to something like Bloomberg as a company versus a university. So you charge everyone the same amount for these accesses. And it can be $500 or $2,000 a year to subscribe, or even sometimes $30 a paper. Imagine now that every single one of these things is built in with a methodology for payment. So over time, the authors can be automatically paid. The editors, the publishers, tax, all happens automatically allowing people to actually get the value in their, their sort of creation that is actually there. Not because it's locked away, not because um, JSTOR can't figure out a way to sell these things, but because we can sell them so that every time someone reads it, they can get a fraction of a cent. And no one's going to build a system to steal copyright if you do it cheap enough. And so kind of now digging in a little bit deeper of uh, that, th there is this mindset that most people have that if you were in the world of blockchain or cryptocurrencies, that they are all anarchists and anti-government. You do not come across to me as somebody who is an anarchist, who is anti-government, uh, who lets the, the weak just die. You seem to be fighting a system that you see is broken and, and you want to help the people make it better. Yes. Anarchy doesn't work. I mean, all anarchy ever does is lead to another strongman coming to, to take power because there's no way in a ruleless system that you're going to get everyone to agree to the same way. I mean, if you think about it, no one ever has the same sort of idea, the same aspect of what they want, the same thought that's going to come to the end of some sort of process. They're always going to basically have disagreements, whether we're talking about a family unit, whether we're talking about a workplace, whether we're talking about a country. No one ever agrees. So we need rules as a way of structuring how we actually deal with problems, with disagreement. And sitting there going, we don't need any of that. We're all going to be fine. Well, that's not what humans are. And we are humans. Humans disagree, humans fight, humans argue. It would and, be impossible for everybody to get along. And, and I find that there are many leaders in the cryptocurrency space or creators of tokens, coins, that seem to always have some sort of bickering between them. That, but that is normal in a world of business, that you do, you do bicker, you do argue with your competitors. But this space is a little bit unique and different in that the world of social media kind of magnifies everything a, a, little, bit, a little bit bigger that the people see something and they hear something and they don't get that other side to it, which was for me quite eye-opening. When I got to meet you, I went, well, he, he's not the scumbag that the people told me he was. He's not as dislikable as I read online, that you actually are a human being that is trying to make a difference, that we aren't always going to agree with each other on, on politics or e even dogma, morals. We'll never agree completely, but you are doing something and using the gifts you've been given to make a difference, that you were focused on changing the world. What is the one thing you would say, Dr. Wright, God forbid something happens to you on a week, 10, 10 years from now, but what is that one thing you'd say, man, if I could just be known for, that at the end of my life or at the end of Dustin's life, Dustin loved dot, dot, dot the most. If I were to say to you, Dr. Craig Wright, at the end of Dr. Craig Wright's life, Craig loved dot, dot, dot the most, what would that be? For most people out there outside my family, I don't care. That's where you're going wrong. I mean, you're, you're trying to say, what will people remember me as? I don't care. What I want is people to use my system. I want people not 
to even think about me. I want them to use my system. You want to be Not anonymous people. in a way. That, that's a beautiful thing. Not anonymous. I just don't care about being known. But I don't want them speculating on exchanges. That's not new. Gambling is not new. And gambling on something where people can manipulate the system and it's not fair, i.e. the whole exchange um, tether world, that's not good. Can what you I dig in? And I, I apologize, Dr. Greg, but I need you to dig in a little bit more because that when we talk about manipulation, you're telling me this world of cryptocurrency is manipulated? Like, come on, it, it's impossible. How is it impossible when you have a unregulated system running on a bunch of bucket shops that run around without doing money laundering rules, allow people to have multiple um, uh, sort of accounts? Um, for instance, Binance, as an exercise to make a demonstration to some regulators, I set up 10,000 email accounts in a day. Uh, went through, just scrolled through, oh, sorry, a week for that one. But I went through, uh, scrolled through them all, set them all up, um, then started populating some of them with uh, uh, Bitcoin and, and um, basically demonstrated that the so-called two Bitcoin a day limit, which is over money laundering regulation requirements anyway for what you need to report, is just BS. And if I can set up thousands of accounts just based on an email, that's how I prove who I am because I've sent in an email which I can automate, then I can set up and start manipulating because I can have my money on this side sell to me on the other side, especially if I pick the right markets. And even with things like BTC, there are trades BTC not to US dollars, but to pounds, which are less liquid, and other currencies. So BTC to weird assed coin, and you can pump and and yeah. make things go up and down, and then you can sit there on YouTube and go, wow, there's going to be a rise today. Manipulate, manipulate, rise happens, dump to all your followers. And that's criminal. People go to jail for doing that on shares. It's called a bucket shop. The reason we have all these regulations is not because, well, we want to um, avoid government and, and uh, they're naughty and we're just going to whatever. The reason we have these regulations is to stop fraud. And when you can have people get onto a system and actually buy and sell their own trades and manipulate it, or even worse, when you are the exchange doing that, then you take average people's funds, average people's savings, average people's retirement money, and you funnel it to criminals. That's wrong. And, and that's going on in, again, I'm not saying in your opinion, because you can say you've got the facts, but that's currently going on in this space, which means that the governments around the world they also know about this. This isn't some big secret yeah, that only two people. Slow. Government is slow. I mean, they're not incentivized to actually go out and take these things down until they get large. And for all the hype, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, everything like that is still small. I mean, but it doesn't appear to be small. Or maybe it's just those of us in this space, it seems to be very big. Uh, 20 years ago, digital currency world was in the order of two trillion dollars big number big number that, which that's is a very big number yeah i mean that's eight times the entire crypto space at the moment you know so kind of some final questions because i promised you i'd only take about 30 mm -hmm. minutes of your time uh michael errington who's also a, a buddy of mine i had uh, somebody else by the name of brad and i had a conversation with him in singapore and and we both were convinced, at least at that time, that there will be many cryptocurrencies or currencies that will win. And Michael said, well, how can you be so certain that maybe there won't be? Maybe there will be just one. You've said that that, that is also a possibility. So as an investor in the no, space... I'm saying there'll be one or zero. There will be... Oh, so all right, let, let's talk about that a little further, that there will either be one or zero. So could a blockchain survive independent of 
it's token. It's token. No. no, it can't. The Why not? token is necessarily how the um, uh, the miners, the the nodes, are incentivized. So this whole idea that everyone runs a node is BS. Um, I mean, I've tried to point out to people that in the difficulty period of Bitcoin, there was 2016 blocks every um, sort of reset period, meaning the maximum number of nodes that you can actually have because the consensus method is creating and, and distributing blocks. So you can never have more than 2016 uh, individual nodes. In the last five years, the total number of nodes, the total number of entities that have ever created a block on Bitcoin over the last five years, 98. You can go onto um, any of the sites that monitor the number of um, um, sort of different entities mining at the moment, and you can check that. In the last year, 32. And more importantly, over two thirds of the network is five companies. So if you have five companies, then they've got to earn money and they've got to do it legally and legitimately. And if they're not getting tokens, why are they continuing? What, to pump their price? They're not going to keep paying electricity for that. So the system is you earn money by validating transactions. You start with a subsidy and the subsidy slowly disappears and as it disappears you replace it with fees not big fees because in economics we have substitute goods if the price of milk goes up then people buy something other than milk i mean there are alternatives there is oat, oat milk or things like this um, so one price goes up something else replaces it and the same thing will happen with cryptocurrencies, the price of transactions goes up, you will use something else, banks or cash or whatever. So what we have is a system that is designed either to have lots and lots of transactions and all of those uh, fees in bulk pay people or to disappear. Remembering Raspberry Pis won't help secure the network. Remember, each of those miners is connected to everyone. So if you plug into the network, there's no propagation by your miner, uh, so your node. Your Raspberry Pi doesn't help. Let's do a little exercise. The average time to transmit a, um, a block anywhere in the world, taking the 80 millisecond around the other side of the world and, and whatever else out of the equation, um, just take half of that for the other ones, is generally about um, 20 seconds plus the global latency for miners. It's around 600 to a uh, second and a half for the Raspberry Pis. So by the time you're not doing anything node, um, actually gets out there and does something, you'll find that every single miner already has the transaction within two hops. So we need a system that works because it gets paid. No pay, why do we keep doing it? There'd be no, they wouldn't be incentivized. So exactly. if you are an investor in the space, that the challenge is who do you invest in? I mean, which companies do you invest in? And those of us that are located in the United States, the challenge of buying BSV is that it's not on the major exchanges. Is that something that will change? And I know that you're not focused, and I'm not suggesting you are focused on price because you're focused on the tech end. And I will tell you, and, and I love that response because uh, so Jed McCaleb, also somebody I'm, I'm very good friends with, uh, that Jed is also focused on the tech. I mean, he's one of those, I'm the tech. He loves the technology aspect. That, but why is it that more exchanges in the United States don't pick up BSV? I mean, why is, uh, this is my word, not yours, but why does there seem to be this group, that this large, again, my word, not yours, uh, of, a, of a conglomerate, a, a cartel that seems to be anti-BSV? Again, my words, not yours, Doc. Why is that? Well, they want to try and tell regulators that they're outside of the law and 
whatever else. So they're trying to do the normal, push things further um, and change law type attitude that a lot of people do. And it's my opinion, by the way, this is not meant to hurt anybody, shame, like it, it is my opinion, but it, it is very odd that the major exchanges that, that I live on that they don't have it. And I'm like, why not? Like, why wouldn't you give me the option? Like, if, if you don't like them is one thing, but don't take away that option from me. Well, um, all I can say is talk to them. Um, I can't help you there. I'm not, I'm not pushing it. Other people might be. I, know. But, uh, I, know. I just want people to use. So I don't really care if you what you build on it. If you build other applications that use the tokens, I... Um, don't really care if you build a central bank currency on top of BSV, which is actually a really good thing because then it's like building US dollar on top of gold and we become the underlying foundation of it. So uh, I'm not going to fight that one. I mean, all these people seem to think, fight the central banks. Well, why not subvert them? Um, yeah, and, and them, someone just reported Bitrix. I mean, yeah, someone you, just said you can buy BSV on Bitrix, by the way. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, why would you want to have a, a platform that limits itself? Why would you want to say, this is my internet and someone else can have their internet over there? Why not be everything to everyone? And then you don't really care if someone likes you or not. They can build on top it's of you and they can hate your guts. And most people will sit there and go, well, I hate Bill Gates and all the rest and still use his products. So, and there's a lot of conspiracies right now going on all around the world about this pandemic. I got to get your mm -hmm. thoughts on it, Dr. Wright. You're a smart dude. I mean, do you think the truth is somewhere in the middle? Do you think that they're keeping all of it from us? Do you think we know everything? What are your opinions on the current pandemic? I think there are a lot of idiots that um, should never have been hired who have become government experts. Is so that the simplest way to put it. That, that, so um, that I don't think there's any word. intentional um, conspiracy. I just think none of these people who are working for the government are smart enough to have gotten themselves a real job ever in their life. And now they get to do their quackery. Um, so you've got people like, um, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, Imperial Colleges um, quack, uh, who made up his piece of shit model that can't even give the same results twice in a hundred runs um, and, and um, they come out there with no understanding of any of the math behind things who have studied the English behind epidemiology and run around going, R naught is just an average. R naught's not a bloody average. R naught is an average in a shitty model. Um, if you actually understand anything about network modeling, you will start to understand that if you have a non-even R naught type thing, you end up with cluster effects. So you get um, small world networks are a possibility, but even when you don't have those, you get the formation of nodes and giant nodes. So you get this sort of methodology where um, even though on average you can have an R naught or propagation rate of less than one, the real propagation is actually larger. Why? Because everyone's densely connected to an individual somewhere or something like this, or a group of individuals, maybe Amazon drivers who are giving out parcels, yeah. <laughs> that sort of yeah. thing. And then um, we run around going, we've got to screw over the world's economy, making more unemployed than we even had in... Um, sort of the Great Depression and, and ruining everything and setting the world back 20 years. And why to get a vaccine when there have never been any coronavirus vaccines in human history for any of them, not for SARS, not for MERS, uh, not for the common cold ever. With the average, I mean, this, it's this thing, we're going to scientifically solve all of this. The average is 14 years to find a vaccine. That's a long time. I mean, this the, the idea behind the herd immunity, so my wife is from Sweden. In the beginning, I know my country, we were laughing at the Swedes like, ah, these people, they're so messed up. I can't believe they're not shutting things down. And now they're noticing that curve has dropped significantly. And they that won't that get another one and another one 
And another one. The herd immunity seems to be the better solution. Again, I am not an expert. I'm not giving people medical advice. But that those countries that are doing it different seem to be getting a different result. Hmm. And, I mean, what people have got to start realizing is that there are people with problems. So you don't screw up the teenagers and the 20-year-olds. They're the people who need to be working and studying and living more than anyone else. And they're not the ones dying. So start thinking about letting them become immune. I mean, you, you tell me I'm wrong, but by the world shutting down, so to speak, you are bankrupting countless individuals that will never come back from this. They and their, the next generation will struggle to come back from it. Countless yes. businesses that will never reopen. They will never reopen. And so that the big box shops of the world, the biggest corporations that had their backup plans, they win in all this. So how is it that people should be excited to go, well, I'm getting government money or I'm getting bailout when long term, this is not going to be a good thing, shutting the world down. You can't just shut down for three months. Inflation is really about the amount of goods versus the amount of money. And we can sit there going, short term, we're not seeing inflation. But long term, we are stopping restaurants. We're stopping production. We're stopping production of goods. So short term, there's no inflation because... None of us are doing anything. You can't spend your money on a restaurant. You can't spend your money going out and enjoying yourself, going to a hotel, using services, getting a haircut. So right now, inflation is under control and check. But what happens when suddenly people get out of this? When there is more money out there that people want to spend, when people start getting back into working and the economy starts to grow and we don't have the goods yet. That's when inflation hits. That's going to be a challenge. And the gold standard. So in the world of cryptocurrency, you have lots of people believing that their token or this asset or that asset will be tied to gold because long-term gold is going to be the, the standard. Do you believe that the governments of the world will go to a gold standard? Mm, no, I don't. Um, I don't believe governments will go to a gold standard. Um, there are... A number of problems with the gold standard and um, the thing people don't really think about is um, gold is difficult to move from place to place uh, because it's physically locked in different areas um, there's never you can never really account for the amount of gold so gold as cash worked gold as a gold exchange standard doesn't it has problems and over time it um, it ends up where you had with the US where um, they just say well we're not going to redeem anymore too bad yeah I also heard another crazy conspiracy and again I like your opinions is that do you think there's going to be some sort of global debt forgiveness that the, the governments of the world a collective will come together because to me the debt seems to be at a point where you can't dig out there is no way to get out of this thing without a global reset, or, or is there, Dr. Wright? Well, what happens if you reset? Then what about the people owed the money and the debts and bonds and instruments that are built on top of that money? So if you have some global jubilee right now, it's not going to save people. It's just going to cause dominoes to start falling. But then what is the solution when you have, when you have world, a world that is in so much debt? I mean, if everybody seems to owe everybody, why couldn't they just forgive it? Or, or, or I, I think the better the better question is... But everybody doesn't owe everybody. Some people owe others. And there are always those who have a lot of debt, but also assets, and those who have money owed to them. So what do you do? Now leave those people with all their assets? So imagine I went out there and bought 20 holiday homes and I did the Airbnb bit and say, I'm going to be rich because I'll pay them off in 20 years. And, and I, then I end up with a lot of money, but the person I took a private loan from goes bankrupt. I mean, does that really incentivize people to actually do things well? No, great, great, great point. And what happened now in China where this virus, based upon the facts that we've been given, now I'm not an expert, I'm not there 
on the ground that that it originated, at least what the, girl, the world's governments believe there, and that then the information coming out was not as fast as it could have been. What do you think, Dr. Wright, based upon, again, you have this ability to look at it from a different spectrum mm -hmm. to say, do you think they did things right? Do you think they did things wrong? And, and if so, if they didn't do it right, should there be a retaliation? And what would that even look like? Because I don't, I'm not a fan uh, of hurting the I, people. Like the Chinese people themselves don't hurt them. Like they're not no, responsible for it. I think the problem in China is there's no real information gets out. Um, it, it's controlled. The economy there is controlled. The media is controlled. And people live in this world where they get fed one lie after another. So that just goes out to the world. And, and the whole thing is massaged before anything gets said. Now, that doesn't mean that I would believe a conspiracy about things. If I actually had to say what I believe, I believe... I mean, from looking at the math and the data myself, um, I don't think this started when people say. I think it probably started around September, October last year. Um, and it wasn't Wuhan. It was more provincial, but that's where it got detected. And a lot of these things start that way. Uh, people look for the first place that it gets detected. They don't think about where that came from. Uh, and a question just came in uh, from yeah. Let's Create Nine. Would love to hear about Dr. Wright's solution to sovereign I identity. Okay, so what I believe is you need to be able to link different aspects of your identity. Right now, if you're getting a bank account or something like that, you do a 100-point check. We need to be able to do some sort of digital version of the same. So I should be able to have a passport and have that electronically being able to go up to you and show you my passport, I should be able to do something like an oblivious transfer of information that allows me to prove my passport without giving you anything that you can use to actually say you've got my passport. A token, an exchange that proves to you that I have my passport and no more that is then final at that point. On top of that, my driver's license, my other things, the way we have identity right now, except without the ease of copying them. So if I want to digitally prove my passport, I send you a scan, which if I send you an email or even over a website into a database, a scan of my passport, within a week, there's probably a hundred other people have a copy. So I should not have to give you a copy. I can prove something digitally without giving you the information the technology exists for doing this so set up systems to do it right now my identity card um, here as a residency card in britain is a smart card so why can't i use that the same as my passport has a smart card to digitally sign a message proving at a point in time that i'm communicating with you and no more I mean, that would be a good thing to do. And then we can build up the level of identity and then even take it further, bring in some of the old concepts like role-based access control but and federated identity and start thinking about maybe rather than having, I have to prove everything I am, prove I have a driver's license. Don't give my name, just be able to sign with a driver's license proving that it's me. So maybe go into a third party so I can sign something to the Department of Motor Vehicles. They give me back a token and I send you the signed token proving that I'm able to drive. Well, I'm gonna have to ask you a question now because there, there's gonna be probably many of the, uh, of the Christian faith as well as different religions as well, that they believe, or some of them believe, in this thing called the mark of the beast. You know, and in the book of Revelation, there'll be either on your forehead or on your wrist, that it's almost as if that this gets us into that sort of model where you could put something, a code, a number in a wrist or a forehead, and easily be scanned. I mean, isn't a digital identity, is it getting us there, or is that at the spot? No, I think it's the opposite. So... If you do it where you start, everything is in one central identity, then yes, you're correct. But that's why we want to have lots of individual things, not COVID tracking and saying who I am, but saying simply, I've got an exposure marker. 
So you don't need to even say who you are to identify certain things. And we've got to be smart with how we do things. Pseudonymy can actually link into the required information without giving out too much information. And it's always a balancing uh, sort of type rope. Um, I mean, um, I'm not one for how people take revelation because, I mean, um, it's written by John of Zebedee, who was way, way after. He, he's about 200 or something AD. Um, so he came in afterwards and they tacked that bit on at the end. And then the whole prophecy bit and how people interpret it gets a bit wacky. Um, so there's too many versions of uh, what people say with the number of the beast and all this stuff. And uh, you can take it a bit too far. Um, I don't believe that... Um, I mean, the answer here is make sure we build systems that protect our human rights. That's a big one. A I mean, so th that to me is, and, and we're kind of final, and I promised my producer we wouldn't keep going, but this is so much fun. And, and I have heard from many people been tuning in, Dr. Wright, that you and I got to do this more often. People are saying he's very likable. I went, I told you, he, he's a very likable guy. And you might find, as you'll hear it hopefully on the next episode of Dr. Wright myself, of that I lost my sister. Uh, from opiates, and that is something that Dr. Wright is doing to to help change in the system, the, the tracking of where these drugs are going and, and who's getting them. That way there isn't this disconnect in the system. So final words you have, uh, Dr. Wright, on someone that's looking to learn more, people that unfortunately have read something and it may not be the truth. What advice do you have for people out there? Think. I know that's a hard one, but don't just listen to someone, not me, not government, not anyone. Actually, listen, take in what they've said, and check. I know that means work, but everything good comes with work. Um, so, I mean, I've spent a lot more time in my garden, um, and it actually looks good for once uh, without my traveling. Uh, so we've got vegetables actually coming up. And <laughs> what kind of, I got to ask you, when Mullet, thank you again for supporting the show. But Dr. Wright, what sort of vegetables do you have growing in the garden? Uh, chilies, beans. Capsicum, uh, pumpkins. Um, gonna do the whole pumpkin bit. Wow, uh, pumpkin bit. You're being all. You're, you're going American, huh? You get. <laughs> you're gonna get a pumpkin pie too. Like what? What do you? What I actually do you quite pumpkin? like pumpkin pie. Do you I, like I, pumpkin pie? I do. I like my. Pumpkin. I can't. Get, I can't get into it. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, Doctor Wright. Uh, I, again, I, I consider you a friend. Thank you for uh, giving me always giving me advice offline. And um, I, again, I, I think the world of you, man. And so hopefully we can do this again soon. For those of you tuning in. Uh, life's tough. Crypto is tougher. In this case, blockchain is tougher. Uh, but luckily, we have people like Dr. Wright out there uh, that are doing everything they can to change the world. Thanks again, Dr. Wright. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon, my friend. Talk to you soon. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.